Welcome to the Successful Athletes Podcast presented by Trainer Road, where we interview successful athletes to make you a faster cyclist. And this week we're joined by Georgina Van Von Marburg, all the way down in Canberra, Australia. How are you doing, Georgina? I'm good. How are you today? Doing doing really well. I'm excited to do this episode uh, because and you were a tennis player and had aspirations of becoming a professional tennis player, then smash cut to today. You've used Trainer Road to raise your FTP by 25 watts. You're at three watts per kilogram, and you've recently qualified to race the 2022 EWS series as a pro, which is like a huge accomplishment. So congratulations on that and all the other things. We're going to get into all these details, but how did you go from aspirations of being a tennis player to, to where you are now? Like that's such a huge shift. Yeah. Ah, it's a bit of a long story, but basically, um, yeah. So when I was in my early mid teens, um, tennis in Australia is huge and a lot of people play it here. Um, and so when I was little, I was, I was very, very keen on becoming a professional tennis player, whether that was realistic at the time or not, I'm not sure, but I was, I was training pretty hard. Um, I remember being 15 years old and getting up at 4.30 in the morning, going out running and then heading to the court and smashing balls against a wall for two hours. And um, yeah, so I was very, very into it. Um, so I was no, and I was no stranger, I guess, to structured training and discipline um, and sport in general. Um, but then for a few different reasons, um, I gave it up in my late teens Mostly because, and I think I'll come back to this later in cycling because I had a very opposite experience. Um, I didn't really have like a proper mentor or someone who could um, show me the big picture. Um, and so me being like a very competitive and impatient person, I just, yeah, I got, I got quite frustrated with the sport. Um, so I gave it up and decided to focus on studying instead. Um, so I went to, I did my undergrad in Sydney um, my family is from Albury, which is a rural town in, or not really rural, it's just a small town in New South Wales. I ended up going to Sydney uh, to study my undergrad, and that's where I got into cycling. Um, and like most people, I got into it through the local bike shop um, near our university, um, and they set me up with a, <laughs> a little nine-speed giant talon, which is, I think, what majority of people start on these days. And mm -hmm. I just, I just go out on the weekends and, you know, thrash it around the Parramatta park or something. Um, and then later they also got me into road cycling. So I got a road bike um, and just started following the boys around town a bit um, and really got into that. And mostly like, I guess at the time, the main reason I enjoyed it is because I was suffering from a lot of mental health issues at the time at university, like a lot of young people do. Um, mm. and for me, cycling really grounded me. I think I liked the idea of being able to go out for like hours at a time and just be fully present and in the moment. Um, and like, yeah, you can get that really through any sport. Um, but there was something in particular that was very, um, as hard as, it, as hard it is, as it is, it was very relaxing in a way as well. Um, and I really latched onto that and it became like a real rock for me, um, on a daily basis is just getting out of my bike, whether it was like, if it was raining, I just get on the trainer or if it was nice, I would just, you know, go for a, like a 50 K ride on the bike path or something and, and just get out and do it. Um, inevitably being a competitive person, I wanted to start racing. Um, so when I moved, uh, to Canberra for my postgraduate, um, I got involved with the local cycling team at university um, and they really introduced me to racing. Um, I started doing a little bit of track cycling as well, um, but I think I liked road a lot more because I liked being outside um, and I wanted to really keep that element of, of cycling that, that um, intrigued me from the start. And so I did a bit of road racing. I joined a, there was a really cool little development squad for women in Canberra um, called CBR Cycling. Um, and they really took me in and they had uh, quite a few, like they had like basically like a, an elite team and then like a development squad. Um, and so they really took me in and a lot of the elite girls showed me the ropes and, and helped me build up my confidence um and then actually through some of those girls on the team I rediscovered mountain biking um and I hadn't had it at that stage I hadn't had a mountain bike for quite some time um so I got I went out and got a um a Trek top fuel 
Um, and I was like, when I got it from the bike shop, I was like, I'm not going to do racing. I'm just using this. I'm just going to go out on fire roads. Um, I want to stick to road cycling. I love racing crits and road and blah, blah, blah. And there's no way I'm ever going to be a mountain bike racer. And like <laughs> the bike shop owners, if you ask them today, they will confirm that story. They'll be like, Regina was so not anti-mountain biking, but just so against the idea of doing technical riding or anything. And I was like, yeah, I just want to like to supplement my fitness, road, road, road. <laughs> and so I got the top fuel. Um, and I went down to a race with some of the elite mountain bikers on that team. Um, and I, just because just to be a swanny, just to help out, pass biddens, whatever. And one of the girls was like, oh, no, you should race. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, I don't know if that's such a good idea. Like. I can barely ride a green trail competently at this stage. And they're like, no, 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 just come race. So I was like, oh, okay, I'll just enter like um, what we call like the expert category here, um, which would be like for you guys, I don't know, like cat two or three. Um, so I just entered like the lower category, um, <laughs> just did a practice lap of the course the morning of my first XCO ever. And I was like, holy damn, like, this is so hard. <laughs> I could not believe how steep the climbs were and how technical the descents were. I was like shuffling my bike down. I had to get off and walk for half of it. And then like, I just couldn't keep my traction on the climbs. I was spinning out. And I remember this, this lady who was in masters coming past me and being like, you're doing awesome. You're doing awesome. And she's like, have you, have you ridden mountain bikes before? And she's like, and I was like, no, no, I'm just a trackie. And she was like, oh, well, keep turning left. So, yeah, she was, uh, that was, that was really cool. Like the whole community in mountain biking is just so welcoming and awesome like that. Um, but yeah, so I did that. I, I rolled into second place because there were only two girls racing in my category. So I was like, yes, <laughs> hey, silver medal. Take, gotta show good. up, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> gotta be in it to win it. Um, and then after that race, I was just hooked. Um, I was mm. just, I was showing up to all the clubbies. I was really getting into uh, marathon racing because it was, it suited me because it was less technical and more fitness orientated. So that was a really good entry point for me. Um, so I did quite a few marathons. I did quite a few stage races over the course of like, you know, 12, 18 months. Um, and then, wow, this is really rambling. Sorry. <laughs> oh, it's fine. Yeah. I'm going to have follow-up questions, but this is great. <laughs> cool. Cool. Um, then, uh, through some guys at the bike shop that I used to work with, um, they were really into like free riding and enduro and stuff like that. And we just would just go out to the jump, um, park here, Tuggerong Pines. Um, and we would just go out there on a weekend and I would, most of the time I would just watch them do jumps. <laughs> like, I was like, I'm not doing that. I'll like take some photos for you guys, but I'm not, I'm not doing the job. Um, but yeah, sooner or later they coaxed me into doing a few jumps on my XC bike and I was like, woo! And there's like some really bad photos of me, like just <laughs> pulling with my cleats, like just the worst technique in the world, but I was having a blast. Um, and then, yeah, and then, yeah, just I just started getting more and more into it. Ended up buying like a Fuel EX, which is like a, a trail bike, so 130 mil travel. And, but for me, 130 mil travel was like, you know, a little crit racer here. I was like, whoa, that's a big bike. <laughs> like, yeah, that's yeah. massive. <laughs> and I ended up doing like all these downhill clubbies and like festivals and everything and just, just getting out there and having a crack, um, just like wanting to race my bike so much. Um, and <laughs> yeah, then I realized that it was probably not the best bike to be doing enduro and downhill on. So I ended up getting a bigger bike. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, fast forward a few months from there, I just about, uh, it's probably like October last year, I sold my XE bike um, and fully committed myself to training and racing for enduro. So it's exciting. Yeah. Like, so <laughs> across this whole range, uh, we're already recognizing the fact that you're absolutely a cyclist because you went through so many bikes throughout the process, right? That's like <laughs> yeah. a rite of passage. You're also a, a fantastic example of us that say we will never do something and then we end up doing it. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. but I want to step backwards. So you, you, you had this development going through road cycling, track cycling, cross country, 
than to more gravity focused style racing. Mm -hmm. But when you first started riding mountain bikes, one of the things that you mentioned to me originally here was that you noticed that you were like your, your rate of progression was faster or was fast enough so that you were getting competitive relatively quickly. Mm. Why do you think that was like, yeah. why were you able to ramp that up? And was it just, and, and let's just focus maybe on the fitness side first, or maybe yeah. if it was the descending side, we can talk about that. Yeah. But why were you relatively speaking, progressing faster than other people? Um, so when I think about that, I think, I mean, like I was just to put it all in perspective, I was definitely not beating elite, other elite women by a far stretch. Like I would always enter the elite category because I felt, or I ended up always entering the elite category because I felt like the category below was just getting a bit too easy and I really wanted to push myself. So, but I would always be on the tail end of elite. Um, but in terms of getting, you know, from point A to B, I think it was really just, <laughs> this is what everyone says, hard work. Like I really just, um, like I was saying, like when I was younger, I was very accustomed to how hard you had to work in sport to be any good. Um, and I would just, I would be very, very consistent and dedicated with my training. Um, so I would, I ha I've been through several different people in terms of being like coached or um, just, you know, writing programs for me and stuff. Um, but I would, yeah, I would not miss a training, uh, training opportunity. That's for sure. And I, if anything, I feel like maybe girls, I feel have this problem more than guys is that we tend to overtrain quite easily. We get very sort of obsessive and think that we're not good enough and think that we need to do more and blah, blah, blah. But if you're surrounded by the right people, it's um, you're less likely to fall into the pitfalls of, of uh, under recovering basically. Um, so yeah, I think I was very, very consistent uh, with my training and I did the right kind of training to get me where I needed to be um, at the start line. And I think more than anything, like maybe, it was just the fact that I was racing so much. Like I went through a period where I was nearly racing, like whether it was a clubby or a, or a national race, I was racing nearly like every weekend, like just race, 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 race. And that like nothing gets you experienced and prepared and fit like pure racing, Like you just got to do it. Um, so yeah, I think just, me progressing so fast was due to me just just taking on the racing and just having a crack rather than spacing it out um like a lot of people will just oh they'll do a race and then three or four months later do maybe try another race but i was like no nah, next week i'm doing this race so mm. yeah it was <laughs> i really crammed in the training <laughs> did you when you were playing tennis and growing up doing that um did you I, that's a sport where you have matches and you might even have like multiple matches in a day. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. then, you know, even and then multiple of those, like you'll play multiple sets during the day and then you'll have multiple matches, match opportunities, possibly even within a week. Yeah. So sure. did it, I, do you think that that altered your expectations for what racing would be? Definitely. Like for us, like as uh, tennis players, you know, you, it's not such a big deal to have a match. You know what I mean? Like you will do it several times a week. Like mom and dad would drive us out to this like little country town in the middle of nowhere, like 20 minutes from our place. And it's just like the crappiest courts, but we would go out there on a Saturday and we would play like four or five matches, like just all day long. Um, mm -hmm. And that was just what you did. And then during the week, like you would have a practice match or like, you know, you'd be doing drills and, you would just be doing like what is specific to what you want to do, which is, you know, winning matches. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think that mentality, uh, which is very prevalent in bowl sports in particular, um, really contributed to that. Mm. You, you started to get known for being like a, a good descender too, or at the very least a person that was fast to go in, things got kind of tricky, right? Um, yeah. Where, where do you think that came from? Because once again, this is, doesn't seem like there's a whole lot of a parallel to draw from tennis to, to cycling. So how kind of touching on the same question, how were yeah. you better in terms of descending compared to your competition? What were you doing differently? 
Um, well, I think like my coordination and my reflexes were obviously very good from doing like bowl sports as a kid. Um, so I was very switched on when it came to the technical mm. stuff. Um, by no means, again, the best ascender out there, but definitely compared to everyone else at my level, like I was known, you know, George is going to be fast on the descents. So, mm. um, I think, um, yeah, I was just, I kind of, I really quite early understood the concept of picking a good line and how to pick a good line and like the, the options for that line. And that definitely, um, you know, coming from tennis, like <laughs> you are just picking spots in a court, like, and you're picking how you're going to get around your opponent. So just that like conceptualization was um, really contributed to that, I think. And also when I was younger, uh, I don't think I put this in in the email I sent you, but I did like I had a little mini bike, like a motorbike, a little Honda um, uh -huh. 70cc, um, and I would just like riff around the paddocks on that. I never did motocross like, competitively or anything, but when I was like 12, 13 years old, um, me and my brother would ride the motorbike quite a bit. So, and, you know, we were literally just in gum boots. There was no, there's no such thing as cleats <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> in motorbikes. So like, I, I think I learned basic um, bike handling and jumping skills from that um, or just, and if any, if, even though I, I forgot a lot of that in between being a child and, you know, being 22 years old, um, even though I forgot some of it, that, that I guess that general courage was there. Like, and mm. because I had done stuff like that as a kid like this wasn't that foreign to me um mm. so yeah there's a few different things yeah you you seem like an athlete that thrives on a challenge right like yeah. like yeah <laughs> like you need something to be kind of pressing you in that regard and then and then you respond to it when yeah. um yeah. So, so when you mentioned the fact that like you got that 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 trek fuel right and or maybe it was the top fuel i can't remember yeah, which one it was but, yeah, the top fuel, fuel. yeah you're racing. Um, and at that point, you know, you're, you end up transitioning to the gravity event. So then you get the fuel EX and you step up there You go into that. Did you notice, because a lot of the time athletes just come into enduro racing and they don't come to it from the XC side. It's less common. That story It's more common. They just like riding bikes and they might even do, do more gravity oriented riding and they come into enduro. So did you notice any advantage coming from cross country into the discipline of enduro racing? Yeah, that, um, that is, that was a huge advantage actually coming from a cross country background, even though when I say cross country background is literally like two years of experience. Um, it was for me, um, I, and I, I still think this today enduro is it's almost more akin to cross country in a lot of ways than downhill um, because you need the, like those persistent bursts of power and long old day endurance of a cross country rider. Because if you don't have that, you can be as technically gifted as you want, but it, you, you, you're still going to be cooked by the last two stages. And you won't be able to, you know, actually display your technical abilities. Um, so coming in from an XC background, I had really good fitness comparatively. Um, and that helped me to just, I could just go all day and the climbs were not an issue for me. And certainly at like a, an amateur level, like everyone complains about the climbing, but I was like, hell yeah, let's do this. Like I, I want to feel cooked at the end of the day. I want to be exhausted. I want to push myself. Um, and so like I could get to, you know, the last stage in a race or if we were doing like a super flow event where you get as many runs as you want, I could keep doing runs all day long um, mm. and not be tired. So definitely like I, I always wish I had way more skill than what I have. And I, I look at the downhillers and I'm just like, man, you guys are so lucky to be, you know, so competent like that. But at the same time, I'm really grateful that I came in from a cross country background um, with, you know, the, the fitness that I came in with and with like just, you know, the, the, the commitment to training, um, mm. which is if you want to do proper enduro, and I'm not just like talking about enduro at like a club level, like anyone can do that, but proper enduro, 
like an AWS stage is, or AWS round is like 40 to 60 kilometers with two, two and a half thousand meters of climbing. Like that's a huge day. And it is not just like going up your local hill a few times. Like they, you, you got to be proper fit for that. And um, you got to be prepared to do the training to get to that fitness. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, having that, having that discipline from XA really, really helped. Yeah, there's something to the all absolute all out efforts that go on in the stage too. Yeah. And they put they they add a level of neurological fatigue that you just don't quite experience in other ones. So it's so and yeah. then it's so it's technical and the consequences are high. It's really such a unique and demanding discipline because of that. Yeah. Um, you yeah. you had this like linear progression in many respects. Like from the yeah. outside in, I'm sure you, you know, you, I'm sure saw plenty of bumps in the road, but it's kind of like linear project or, pro, um, uh, improvement. And then you get to 2019 and you had a crash on the, I think it was a gap jump. Is that correct? A road gap? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was like and literally then, the worst <laughs> road gap in Canberra to try and do your first road gap. Sketchy and, as hell. <laughs> <laughs> and then what was the, so, and then you got injured from this, right? Uh, so explain the injury and then how you uh, kind of came back from that. Yeah, well, I guess um, I was going through, when I attempted that stupid road gap, um, I was going through a period of rapid, which a lot of mountain bikers I feel have this period of like rapid progression in technical ability and confidence. And like I had my, at that stage, I had my first slash, which was, you know, so we're talking like now 160 mil travel. I was like, this is a monster truck. You can do anything. I can do anything. And I was just, again, out at like a jumps track um, with one of the guys from the bike shop. And um, we were just doing jumps. And I did like one sort of gap jump um, just on a trail. And I was like, yeah, that was easy. Let's go find another one. And then as we were riding up the road, I saw like this big road gap over the road that we're riding up. I was like, yeah, I, I want to do that. And Logan, my mate who I was riding with, he was like, oh, I don't know if you can do that. And I was like, no, no, I'm going to have a crack. And he's like, okay, but whatever you do, just this is like the line you got to take and don't touch the brakes. And what do I do as I'm coming in? I touch the brakes. And even just like that feathering of the brakes, like I totally undershot the whole thing and I landed oh. just straight on my front wheel, like all the fork com- fully compressed, I went over the bars, landed on my shoulder um, and yeah, broke the collarbone and fractured my scapula as well. Um, mm. And so yeah, that was, that was a lot of pain. <laughs> um, and, yeah. but it wasn't so much the physical aspect of it that was going to torment me, it was the psychological aspect of crashing. Mm. And I never had a big crash before that. Oh, I had had one crash where like I fractured some ribs, but ribs are one of those things that you can keep riding with. Um, whereas a collarbone, like you're, you're stuffed. So, um, went to the hospital when I was there, um, they did an x-ray they're like yeah it's it's a it's it's fully broken but it's a clean break so there's like a there's a straight line through it's not bent or and it's just you know the the main bone that's broken there's not you know fractures everywhere um so like yep cool you don't need surgery um we'll just wrap it up for you and away you go here's some painkillers go home um so went home and after a few weeks um I noticed that it was really starting to bulge out of my shoulder. Like, and then I went um, to a specialist and I got another x-ray and what had happened um, was probably due to me not being still and resting enough. (laughs) Um, It had gone like from a clean break to looking like a tent (laughs) poking out of my shoulder. So he was like, this is not good. We need to, we need to fix this up ASAP or else you're going to need surgery. Um, so I started wearing like a back brace, um, for quite some time and doing really specific movements just to try and get the bone like pushing back again. Mm. Um, and so got to the point about probably about two months from the crash where, um, I was in a lot less pain. It was starting to heal. The x-ray showed, um, calcification happening around the break. And me and all my medical wisdom, I was like, yep, good to go. Good to race again. Uh, let's get this show on the road. And 
<laughs> I like, I was still in a sling and I was still like when I was at work, I'd still, be, or during the day, I'd still be in a sling and I was still having to wear a back brace just to keep pulling it back. But I was getting on the trainer um, or I was getting on the trainer really like several weeks from breaking it. Um, and I was still going to the gym. I think my girlfriend has this photo of me at the gym, like fully in a sling, like just doing a leg press. <laughs> so I was <laughs> still getting out there and, and trying to do what I could. Um, but yeah, so I thought I, I thought I was good to go. Um, and I went down to <laughs> Derby in Tasmania, which is where um, mm. they've had quite a few of the EWS rounds. And I went down to do the Asian Pacific qualifier down there. Um, and it was an absolute like uh, disaster. It was, that was one of the hardest weekends of my life in terms of uh, on the bike, just being totally incompetent. I had no control of the bike whatsoever. I could not neurologically like just connect my head and my shoulder like and I couldn't because I was um so scared of that pain again and so scared of breaking again like I just had no confidence I couldn't do like even just the most insignificant of drops um or shoots or like anything that would require shoulder effort um because it was it was just not healed properly it was like mm. it was not ready to go um, and so I went there during practice, I, I stuffed up a line and <laughs> ended up like fracturing my wrist or at least spraining it. Um, oh. so I was like cooked even before the race started. Um, so I was dealing with that. And then during one of the race runs, I like just took a crappy line through like a corner and just my right, my shoulder went straight into a tree, like just knocked oh. the living daylights out. And it was so painful. Like, and so after that race, um, instead of um, thinking, I need more time to rest, what became my internal dialogue was, I'm really bad. Like, I'm just a crap racer. Like, I'm not good technically. Mm. And that's what the problem is, not the fact that I hadn't healed enough. Um, and so I kept trying to go to races and I kept trying to train. I, I did like a, a month later, I did this massive mountain biking festival here called Cannonball Festival, um, which is like four days of gravity racing. And I, when I was doing that, like if you asked me to do a push up, then there is no physical way I could have even done a push up. Like it was mm -hmm. just so out of whack. And, um, yeah, it was really, really playing in my head. Um, so for really like an entire year, I spent just in the dumps, like really um, just a total lack of confidence in my ability and really thinking that I wasn't getting anywhere. And cause I'd gone from like, you know, like you said, this linear progression and then all of a sudden like just down and just like, mm. I was like, you know, I've got all the gear, I've got the right bike, I've got the fitness, and I'm still just scared as hell on, on like really big features. Um, so then I decided to, um, in order to deal with that, um, started to really take gym training seriously. And I had never really done gym before that consistently, um, but I started doing it just on my own volition with my, with my own structure and everything. Um, and then a few months after that, I got um, Shana Hearn, who's our, our national downhill champ. She mm -hmm. runs like programs for gravity riders. And I got on one of her programs and she really introduced me to like lifting heavy and lifting, not just like, you know, doing like mild squats and cranes and everything, like lifting proper heavy weights and really targeting your shoulder strength. Um, and that yeah, that just brought back a whole, getting properly strong like that brought back a whole new level of confidence. Yeah. It's interesting how that, I think with athletes, a lot of the time we our, our speed and our confidence progress at such a rate that we don't have other systems or frameworks in place to actually support that. Exactly. And we don't notice it until something really catastrophic happens. And yeah. then it takes so long to be able to recover. It's really, yeah. you've, you've like laid that out really well. And it's once again, a great reason that strength training is important. 
on the yeah. confidence side, um, are there any tips that you would give to somebody who has had some sort of a crash in any sort of way, whatever it may be, but on how to come back and get confidence, rebuild that to what was lost? Yeah, I think in hindsight, what I'd say is obviously let it heal, like let it, let the bone or whatever it is fully heal before you start trying new things again. And even by the time it does heal, like you want to, like, it sounds counterintuitive, but you just want to go back a few steps and just go back to trails that you're super comfortable on and just do them over and over and over again and build your confidence up on trails that you're already comfortable on. Um, don't go out and be like, okay, I'm going to try this new drop today. I'm going to try this new jump. Like, because that's just going to like play in your head even more because that, now it's just like, not only is it a physical challenge, it becomes like a psychological challenge. Mm. Um, so yeah, I definitely say rest, <laughs> recover. And when you start back, like just go to trails that go to your local trails that you're really comfortable on. Mm. Yeah. It's kind of staying within that realm of uh, it's, it's like, uh, it's not excessive to the point where you're not going to be pushed out of your comfort zone, but exactly. staying within yeah. that to rebuild it. Yeah. 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 Um, so with this, this brings us to 20, basically 2020, right? Um, 2019, you had that crash. you got gotten to the point where like 2020, you would probably rebuild for everything. And then of course the pandemic hits and racing doesn't happen. Um, yeah. And that's actually coincides with when you started using trainer road. So yeah. why did you start using trainer road? You've had, you know, years of structure with tennis and stick and ball sports, and then you've taken a really disciplined approach with cycling and everything else. So, so why did you start using trainer road? So I had been listening to the trainer road podcast for like, uh, like a year or two before that. Um, so I was awesome. super familiar with you guys, big fan. Um, <laughs> awesome. <laughs> I, I, I'd always like, um, because for my job, I do a lot of driving. I'd always listen to your podcast in the car. Um, and I, like when the pandemic hit, I was like, okay, shit, there's no racing. And I need something, like you said, like I need a challenge and I need something to keep me motivated and moving forward. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to give this trainer road program that they're all talking about. I'm going to give it a crack and see what it's like and yeah so that's probably the main reason is because I needed a challenge of some sort because there was no racing going on um but yeah it was yeah right when the pandemic started yeah and that's um what did racing give you that you didn't have anymore like since racing was gone what were you lacking I guess that because that's that's something yeah. that I bet a lot of people probably have experienced and I'm not sure if they've put everybody's put a lot of thought into it but mm -hmm. what 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 was where what was the void that was caused I by think reasoning? yeah I I well two things um probably firstly just having a goal um a, a reason for why you're doing it um some people just like to go out and ride and that's awesome and like my partner's like that she just wants to go out and you know just ride a bike and that's that's satisfying enough but for me I'm like why am I doing this it's like mm. you know I was hitting bowls against a wall for three hours every morning because like I wanted to win and I'm riding my bike because I want to win um but yeah not having that meant there was all of a sudden and obviously, you know, you kind of knew that wouldn't be forever, but for a long stretch of time, there would be no goal in sight. There would be no um, end for the means. Um, and the other thing was, and this is something that I've come to realise, um, and I feel like maybe other writers have come to realise it as well, but just are too <laughs> embarrassed to talk about it, is that like racing gives you this sense of, of self-worth and identity and it's really toxic and in, in a lot I mean in some ways it's great but in a lot of ways it's also really toxic and you start to mm. you crave that affirmation and approval from racing and without that there's a massive void and it, it like the pandemic really exposed that and really exposed oh my god like this is like half the reason I want to race is because like I need that affirmation. So yeah, that was pretty interesting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that, that's a really good point that you brought up and thank you for bringing that up because that's like, 
a reality that I think a lot of us do face, like you said, but it's, it's hard yeah. to, to face it head on sometimes. Yeah. Um, how do you, how have you managed that now? Like, has your perspective changed on that or have you learned to channel that in a more productive way into your training? What's what, what have you learned through it? Yeah, I guess. Um, yeah, you, I learned to channel it um, instead of being a results driven person, I became more of a, of a process driven person. I was like, okay, how hard I work and the steps that I take is what defines me, not getting up on a podium. Um, so let this dedication and hard work, let that be your identity, let that affirm you rather than a result which may or may not happen. Um, so that was like a kind of healthy shift in a lot of ways. And I sort of began to reflect how, um, it's the process that I should be proud of, like not a result. Um, and you know, most of the time you don't get a result at a race or you don't get a podium or like you come dead last. So if you're banking on that, <laughs> you're going to, even when races are on, you're going to be left pretty empty handed. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, it became, you know, my focus shifted to, you know, for me, like, you know, just getting out at the end of a long work day, getting out into the gym, that was a win for me. Like, and wow. that was what, what really filled me up. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, a healthy way to do it for sure. Uh, so how did you, when you started using trainer road, how did you start? Like, I assume you use plan builder and, and what sort of plans yeah. did you follow? Yeah, so obviously there's nothing to plan for um, <laughs> at the time. But I mean, I've been listening to your podcast and you guys are like, um, you know, just like even if there's if even if there's no race at the end of the plan, it's still worthwhile doing structured training. So I was like, okay, do a do a plan builder because I was working from home at the time, I had more time to ride. So I would I did a high volume um base phase basically. Um so starting off with sweet spot work um and just a did hard that all plan way. yeah that's a hard yeah. plan yeah i quickly realized that <laughs> <laughs> yep uh, but i was getting to that second week and i was like oh boy <laughs> this, is, this is hard um so yeah i i did that and i basically um as time went on i actually dialed it down and as we started getting Smart. back to work i dialed it down um, so it was awesome because like it gave me something like to really sink my teeth into, but when things started to change and when racing looked like it was going to start coming back, I had to really turn it down. Um, so yeah. And then I think we started, we able, we were able to start racing again in Australia in, it was like September, October, that races sort of started popping up again. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, we started doing a few like just enduros and club level races by then. Um, so I basically had planned my, um, yeah, my, my structure to, to lead up to that point in time. Yeah. So I, I, I think I ended up doing, yeah, that's when I ended up doing like an XCO, um, uh, nice. specifically phase. Yeah. 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 Which, um, it, when I was looking at your career, I recognize those workouts as like, she did the XEO plan. I can tell, I know those yeah. workouts, so. <laughs> they're, they're hard. <laughs> yeah. But they're awesome. It's productive. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and when you're talking about like sweet spot base, high volume, that's like, it's really like by the data, it shows that it's probably only for, you know, it's, it's single digits in terms of the athletes that it's best for. So, um, yeah. super impressive that you were able to take that on and to make it through like you did. It's, um, super cool. So you added an FTP increase from, uh, up to, from 200 to 225 Watts over the course of time now, which is super cool. But I want to talk another thing uh, or about a few different aspects of this. Like you weren't a stranger to structured training, but this was like very much structured. So what yeah. was hard in this process, this training process? Um, when you started using trainer road and you started doing all these workouts and, and following a truly like very, like uh, a very structured program, what did you struggle with? Like, what was the hardest part? Yeah, I think definitely the hardest part is trying to integrate gym firstly, um, and trying to integrate your social rides and your social life. <laughs> so yeah. like, and that's why low volume, that's why I'm on low volume now. Um, because yeah. I'm able to integrate those other inevitable things way more easily. Um, so, I mean, like right now, a typical week for me looks like doing, you know, three trainer road 
um, sessions, two gym sessions. And then on the weekend, I do like a long endurance ride and then a really like technical mountain biking ride. Um, but yeah, being on a high volume plan when I first started, that was the most difficult thing. I was like, mm. I just could not fit gym in and I could not, like if I was doing a ride on the weekend, I had to be like, oh, sorry guys, like, I'm going to do these nerdy intervals while we're out riding because I got to get yeah. done. Um, so you have to be that real nerd in the group. Um, so yeah, that was, that was the hardest part is you don't think about it when you're on the computer setting it up, but like all those other things in life <laughs> that come into play, um, that you are not going to like, you know, drop and you want to keep them. That's, that's really hard to manage on a high volume plan. Yeah. It, it's so smart to plan, to plan that allowance for yourself, right. To be able to have adjustment and change in your life. If you're always pushing up against the stops in your life with some aspect of it, it's going to cause chaos for everything else. Uh, yeah. So that's a super smart thing uh, that you did there. And you also kind of balanced, or you talked about the balance. That was one of the things I was going to ask you about how you structure it. So um, awesome. You do a lot of outside workouts as well, uh, which uh, I'm in the same boat as you. Uh, I'm really fortunate to have like great terrain to be able to do the outside workouts. Um, and I understand that. Not everybody has that. So, um, yeah. but I'm, I, so I, I mix it in and I do specific workouts sometimes inside, sometimes outside all that stuff. But uh, what have you learned in that process of outside workouts? Cause that's really hard for a lot of people at first. Like how yeah. have you like finding the right terrain or maybe even keeping steady power? What was it like learning how to do those really structured workouts outside? Uh, I think, well, obviously the number one thing that you need is terrain. Like mm -hmm. you cannot do it on like undulating roads. Like there's just too many variabilities. You need like, a, you need an accessible 15 minute long climb. And for me in Canberra, I'm super lucky. I live right near Black Mountain. So I use that for nearly all of my outdoor workouts. It's a pretty consistent gradient. It's also quite steep in some sections, which is awesome for those low cadence drills. Um, so you need an accessible geography. Um, for it to work and you need it to be yeah like you know when life gets real busy you need that accessibility to be up there because otherwise you're just not going to be bothered um mm -hmm. so yeah you need like a good place to be able to do your workouts where you can consistently go um and then i mean this is kind of like preferential but i guess for me like i've got a power meter on my bike um mm -hmm. but i also like i've got a power meter on my road bike but i also like to do um, a lot of the workouts on the mountain bike, just because that's what I'll be racing. Um, like, so, you know, you fight, find a fire road that goes for the interval length and then take a technical um, descent um, to the bottom and then, you know, do the next interval. Um, so yeah, you need to be able to do it on a bike that you, you know, that you're happy to do it with. Um, but yeah, I mean, geography is like <laughs> the number one thing. And that's the thing that I struggle the most with is like, okay, today's workout is, a seven, like I was traveling um, down to Ulrey last uh, yesterday and I was like, okay, I have, I have to do these intervals today and I don't know where the nearest seven minute climb is. <laughs> like I need it to be, I need, I need it to be this length. But I can't like, you know, undulate and I can't go back down the hill in the middle of the interval. So yeah, you need to, you need to be pretty organized for the yeah. outdoor stuff. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. Um, with all of the training that you were doing, did you notice that you had to change other aspects of your lifestyle at all in terms of like, um, recovery, sleep, nutrition, as you started, like, uh, whether it's training more or even just the FTP increase that you had, you know, like yeah. as your FTP increased, did you have to change any of that? Yeah. Um, yeah. All of those so important sleep and nutrition, um, sleep. I'm a bit of like a Nazi about like, I need my <laughs> eight hours. Um, and if I don't get my eight hours, I'll not be happy. Um, so I, um, and this is a hard one that I guess you just learn over time. I prioritize my sleep more than my training these days. So mm -hmm. if I go to bed late or I have a really bad sleep and my alarm goes off and it's time to train, but I feel like crap, I won't train. I'll just keep sleeping and I'll just do the train, do the session in the afternoon or at night or whatever. Um, but I'll always, always try to prioritize getting that sleep in, um, because I've done sleep deprived months and 
it's like you think oh yeah I'm getting into the swing of it this is fine and then you just like come to a massive crash mm. and like your motivation dips your social life dips like your training dips like everything just goes downhill after a while um nutrition has been a massive learning curve as it is for like every amateur athlete um because mm. like I growing or like starting in the the roadie community there's a there's there's a lot of misinformation out there um and <laughs> not one food program fits everyone um and like there's a tendency especially in women's in women's road to like really just focus on your weight and what you look like and eating the bare minimum amount um and just like punishing yourself all the time for eating um and it took me like really <laughs> until like the last couple months to grow out of that because it becomes so psychologically ingrained in you um and i've just learned to just eat <laughs> what makes me happy like obviously it doesn't mean junk food but like you know if i'm gonna have a snickers bar on a ride i'm gonna do it like it makes me happy and it keeps me motivated and if i'm happy i'm gonna ride harder so um like you just don't go hungry <laughs> like there is I, if you're a world tour level guy trying to get ready for the tour de france or whatever maybe there's like you know there's a time and place for that but at an amateur level when you're trying to work full time and you know live a good social life don't leave yourself empty because you're just gonna like like wear out so fast i mean last year or the year before last year i think it was like 2018 um or 2019 i was doing i started trying fasted training and i would do like intermittent fasting like full on like i would wake up in the morning so i'd finish eating at like 6 p.m at night and then i would get up do like my my session or whatever bunch ride whatever completely empty maybe with a bit of black coffee and i wouldn't eat till 10 o'clock that morning mm -hmm. and i did that for like months and at first i like started to um my body composition didn't change in hindsight but i started to drop weight and I was like, fuck, yeah, this is, sorry. <laughs> no, no worries. <laughs> we can like, always leave yeah. it out. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hell yeah, this is working. I'm like, I'm getting faster. I'm getting lighter. This is, this is, I'm going to do intermittent fasting forever. And um, it, it came to a pretty grinding hold after about like nine, 10 months. And I just had nothing in the tank whenever I'd go out for a ride, combine that with, you know, then the injury that occurred. Um, like I was already low in calcium magnesium because my bone was trying to heal um, and I was under eating and it was just, my body was so out of whack. Um, and then like, I just learned to, especially like moving with my partner, like she eats, so much and she will laugh when she uses me she just eats so much all the time and she's like happy and energetic and I'm like how do you eat that much all the time like you're constantly eating food throughout the day and she's like oh just hungry <laughs> and like she'll get on the bike and just smash me and like oh man like I'm doing all this hard work and I'm not getting anything out of it um but then yes yeah, so I just like I moved in with her and I just started to like naturally just eat more because you're like you know you eat with other people and I just started to feel better. My body composition totally changed. Um, I feel more energetic. I can do two, you know, training sessions in a day. Like it's not a big deal. And I'm just, mm -hmm. yeah, a better person to be around. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Starving yourself is not, is not good for anybody and no. particularly for athletes, but it's interesting how the athletes, athletes feel more always, pressure to do that. You know? Yeah. 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 So, uh, what are the, what noted differences have you noticed on course, like on track since you started using trainer road? Um, so the biggest improvement I have noticed from is sweet spot training. So for me, like I'd never really done sweet spot training because when I started cycling, everyone's super into like polarized training. So you do, you're either doing VO2 or you're doing nothing at all. Um, and sweet spot is sort of in between and it was that zone where a lot of us are told don't go like yeah, yeah, um, yeah. and 
I started doing that. And I was like, oh, this is, this is like, this is hard, but it's not too hard. And I, I can do this like a few times a week and I feel good after the session and I, this is maintainable and I can do like, um, I can increase my endurance, even though I'm doing an hour in the morning, you know, like it's mm-hmm. still contributing to everything. And so that helped me structure my training better and get more bang for my buck by doing sweet spot. Um, and just that the stamina that comes with sweet spot, like cannot be underestimated, like, mm. especially like in enduro races, um, obviously, you know, it's the descents that matter, but maintaining, like being able to get to the top of the climb and be ready to switch on and do like a five minute sprint is, is like, you know, and that comes from being able to do that climb at a great level. So, Mm -hmm. um, the stamina that I got from sweet spot training, which I'd never experienced before was probably like the, the most noticeable improvement I got. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm excited to see now that you're, cause now you're following gravity plans right now, the enduro plan, I believe, and yeah. or going through the gravity plan. It's going to be exciting yeah. because, uh, to see how you perform there and how it feels to be able to have that repeatability on top of it. It's going to be exciting. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. what are yeah. your goal really events uh, for this, for this year? Which ones are you targeting now that you've qualified for 2022 EWS, which is so cool. Uh, which events are you planning on doing? Um, well, obviously with the pandemic going on still, um, it's hard to get to, to Europe or the U S so I'm probably, I'm really aiming for the Nelson New Zealand rounds, which will probably be around April next year. Um, so, uh, New Zealand is planning on opening up a travel bubble with Australia. So we won't have to quarantine when we go back and forth. Um, so that is like my biggest goal is to, to get over there and race that. And I want to sort of get over there later this year just to check it out and see what the terrain's like. Um, mostly because in Australia, on mainland Australia, our terrain is super, like, we don't have anything very steep. So a lot of our gravity races are very pedally. Um, and it's great for producing really fit riders, but we never really, um, unless you're lucky enough to, like, go overseas a lot if you're a semi-pro or something, like, you never really get to experience what that real steep, rocky EWS level terrain is like. We, mm-hmm. we just can't really get it in Australia unless you're using like, you know, private trails. Um, mm-hmm. So that will be the biggest challenge, I think. Um, and so my, my focus like on the enduro bike is whenever I get out, I go do something steep, like go do something really loose and technical because that's what New Zealand is going to be like. It's not going to be Mount Stromlo. It's not going to be Threadbow. It's going to be like, it is going to be tough and uncomfortable. So Mm. yeah, that's the goal (laughs) to do the Nelson round. That's going to be awesome. That's exciting. Um, Georgina, where can people get in touch with you and follow you along through your racing and life adventures? um two there's two instagram pages so the first one is my own page which is just at georgina von Marburg. and then the second one which i almost want you to follow more than my own is at speed Talk co um this is like a comedic kind of um take on racing that me and my partner have created and we have a lot of like weird fans on there so <laughs> if you want the funny side to riding and being an absolute punter like get on speed Talk co you will froth it <laughs> awesome cool we'll link to both of those down below in the description on the podcast awesome. and on the youtube video if you're watching this if you'd enjoy if you've enjoyed this podcast with georgina you should rate this podcast five stars or if you're watching on youtube of course give it a thumbs up and share it with other people especially those enduro racers in your life mountain bikers women athletes whatever it may be uh so tennis players we've had a lot of cool uh <laughs> touch points on this one uh and if you want to be a part of this podcast and let us know how Trainer Road helped you become a successful athlete, whatever you deem to be success, like in this case, Georgina, transferring through all these different forms of racing, seeing this FTP increase, it's awesome. You can do so at trainerroad.com slash SAP. Uh, Georgina, thanks a bunch, and we'll talk to you all next time. Thanks, everybody. Sounds good. Thanks, Jonathan. Appreciate it. Thank you.